On New Year's Eve 1998, over a thousand young people went out on yachts to a lavish party in the coves of New Zealand. But two of those party goers, 17 year old Olivia and 21 year old Ben, never made it back again to start the new year. So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be discussing the New Year's Day murder of Olivia Hope and Ben Smart. This is also a case with a potential miscarriage of justice in it. I will let you guys make your own mind up as we go through all the evidence. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. This is a really, really controversial case, especially in New Zealand where it happened. It's a really, really big case there. Everyone has differing opinions and a lot of people are on different sides. So I'd be really interested to know what you guys think. But quickly, before I get into the case, I do just wanna thank our sponsor for making this video possible. NordVPN. If you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor, there will be an exclusive deal waiting for you there. And for Christmas, it is four bonus months for free. The link is down below in the description of this video and it is completely risk-free with NordVPN's 30 day money back guarantee. I personally have used a VPN for years and years and years. You guys know this because I've talked about it for years and years and years because it's just so helpful. It's so useful on so many different levels. I've used it to keep myself and all my information, all my personal details secure and safe on the internet for years. A VPN kind of helps to put a barrier up between you and everything that you want to keep safe and horrible people on the outside trying to like hack you and steal your information. So basically how this works is you go on the NordVPN app, you can pick a country and with one click they will make it appear as though you're operating from that country, which comes with so many benefits. You get to use the internet as though you're in that country, which means you get their streaming service selections, their news platforms. I feel like I'm probably one of the only nerds in the world that would get excited about other countries' news platforms, but like there's so many true crime cases out there that I don't get to read about otherwise. There's like YouTube videos that will be blocked in your country that you'll be able to access through a VPN. I know a few of my videos are blocked in different countries. But seriously, the streaming service selection thing is such, it's like a cheat code for life. You can just Google what different countries Netflix has on them and just switch your Netflix to that whenever you wanna watch anything. Such a life hack. And of course they have the threat protection feature now that blocks intrusive ads. It checks the things that you download for potential malware. It's not just a VPN anymore. It's a really powerful cybersecurity tool that I don't want to live without anymore. I love it. I'm so glad I've found NordVPN. I've used them for years and years and years. You guys know I have and I will stand by them forever. I think it's a great service. I think everyone should be using a VPN. If you're using the internet, get a VPN on. Get a VPN. So if you want to try out NordVPN, the link will be down below in the description. It's nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor. If you want to try out an exclusive deal, there'll be one there waiting for you. For Christmas, it is four bonus months free. That's crazy. Four months free. Go to the link. Go do it now. It's completely risk free with NordVPN's 30 day money back guarantee. Go and do it. Thank you so much NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Now before we get into it, I do just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. Just a couple of content warnings before we actually get into the case. This case involves themes of sexual harassment, sexual assault, homophobia and cancer. So if any of those are things that you don't want to hear about right now, I completely understand. Click out this video. Happy New Year. If I don't see you until then, look after yourself. But with all that being said, let's get into the case. So today's case takes place in the Marlborough Sounds, which are like a group of islands off of the north coast of the South Island of New Zealand. That sounds really confusing as a sentence, but hopefully with a visual aid, you'll understand what I mean. It's like off the you understand what I mean? Surely, come on. But yeah, today we're in the Marlborough Sounds of New Zealand on New Year's Eve of 1997 into New Year's Day 1998. There was this huge, huge New Year party being thrown at this lodge in Endeavour Inlet. That's the specific part of Marlborough Sounds that this took place in. There was this huge property there called Ferno Lodge and it was massive. Like it was the perfect place to have a New Year's party. Had an indoor bar, an outdoor bar, the party hosts had set up a marquee, there was going to be live music, they'd thought about everything. A lot of effort had been put into this party, a lot of effort had been put into making sure that 1998 was going to be the best new year 
yet. In attendance at this party at Ferno Lodge was 17-year-old Olivia Hope. She was going there that night with her sister, Amelia. She was an older sister, and honestly, she was more like Olivia's best friend than she was a sister. The two of them were so, so close, and for Christmas, literally less than a week before, they'd both gotten matching inscribed rings with, like, their initials on, because they were, like, best friends. They were inseparable. So going to this party was Olivia, her sister Amelia, and then a group of their, like, shared friends. There were about eight or nine of them in total. So, the only way to get to Ferno Lodge, because it's in the middle of the water, on an island, the only way to get there is by boat. And so these girls had hired their own, well, they chartered a yacht, like a small yacht, for like 24 hours over New Year's Eve into New Year's Day. This was like quite a small yacht. It was called the Tamarack. They planned to actually sleep on there overnight because they all wanted to drink at the party and they knew they wouldn't be able to drive the boat back home. So they were gonna just drive this boat to the party. Well, actually they were gonna party on the boat all day beforehand and then they were gonna drive it to the party. They were gonna dock it and then they were just gonna sleep on there overnight and then drive the boat back the next morning. So. That's exactly what the girls did. They went and got this yacht, they got the Tamarack, they're all partying on there, having a great time. They take it over and they dock it at Inlet, en Endeavour Inlet. Oh my God, all these names have really confused me through my research. They docked it at the party and the celebrations began. They arrived kind of early compared to the rest of the party because they just wanted to get the boat docked so that they could start drinking. So they were there at the party from like 8, 9 p.m., which is quite early to get to a New Year's party. And so as the night went on, the place was getting more and more crowded as people were arriving. And one of the later arrivals at the Ferno Lodge party was 21-year-old Ben Smart. Now, he did know Olivia Hope before arriving at this party. And he actually arrived after midnight, after the clock had already gone, everyone had already had that celebration. He'd been elsewhere with his friends on New Year's Eve, like as the clock struck. And then in the early hours of the morning, he went to go and meet Olivia Hope at the Ferno Lodge party. Olivia and Ben's relationship has a lot of speculation around it in this case. And on one hand, I don't think it really matters. It doesn't play a huge part in this case, like whether they were dating or seeing each other or just friends or acquaintances, whatever. It doesn't matter what they were. That being said, <laughs> I think, there might have been a little something between them. I mean, this was a young lad that had left his group of mates on a night out on New Year's Eve to go and meet a lass and her group of mates and stay with her. I don't know, I think maybe there were I think maybe there was maybe there was a bit of something. It doesn't truly matter, but I think that's the kind of situation that we're looking at. He'd left all his mates to go and meet Olivia and her mates and they all trusted him, you know, he was welcome in their group. So yeah, Ben comes to the party and at this point, people had started to drop off at the Ferno Lodge party because a lot of people were sleeping on boats nearby or they were getting water taxis back to like the mainland and going actual home or staying in a hotel or something. Not everyone was sleeping in boats. So it's now like the early hours of the morning most people are starting to drop off and Olivia Hope and Ben Smart were two of the last of their group to be up and partying. Her older sister Amelia and a bunch of their friends had already gotten water taxis from Ferno Lodge to where their boat was docked and they'd all like gone to bed already. Olivia and Ben were like the last ones up in their group and they ended up checking the time around 3am and they realised it was probably time to go to bed now. So they got like a water taxi or a lift of some kind from the lodge to the Tamarack where they were supposed to be sleeping. And when they got there, it was full, like really full. There were a lot of people on the boat that weren't supposed to be there. So Olivia, Amelia and all their mates had hired this boat, like put money in. They'd all like chipped in to hire this boat to sleep on it. They were the only ones meant to be there but a load of other party goers had somehow found their way onto the boat or been invited on by other people that were on the boat. Either way, there weren't enough space for Olivia and Ben. And Olivia was not happy about this. She was pissed off. And to be fair to her, yeah, she paid to be on there. She paid to sleep on that boat. Those were her plans. She's gotten to that boat and there's literally nowhere for her to sleep, not even on the floor. So Olivia starts kicking up a bit of a fuss. Like she's saying, no, some people need to get off this boat. This is my bed for the night. Use lot didn't pay to stay here. I did, someone move. So she's like arguing a bit. I think some of the girls are arguing back with her. And then one of them ends up making a comment about, well, Ben didn't pay to stay here either. And Olivia didn't really have a response to that because True, he didn't. Um, and in the end, Olivia kind of realised that 
no one was going to get up and leave the boat so that she could sleep. It She was fighting a losing battle. So in the end, she just gave up. She went back out like to where Ben was on the outside of the boat and she was like, I don't think we're getting in there tonight. So eventually, Olivia and Ben managed to flag down a water taxi to come over to the Tamarack to then be able to take them elsewhere, to wherever else they can sleep. The water taxi gets over. Well, actually, it wasn't a water taxi, this one. It was one of the barmen that was literally just doing a favour for people at the party. He wasn't hired to be a water taxi, but he just kind of felt bad for the people that were left over at the end of the night. So he was like, fine get on this boat, I'll give you all a lift. So he'd been giving all these people a lift and then he got flagged down by Ben and Olivia. So he's like, right, guess I'm taking another passenger. He goes up to them and they get on the water taxi and they're like, look, we have nowhere to sleep. We don't know where to go tonight. Do you know like anywhere we can stay? And he was like, on New Year's Eve? Absolutely not. Like he was very matter of fact about it. He was like, you're not gonna find another place to sleep like around here at all. Everywhere will be booked up. Everyone will be already asleep in beds. No chance, sorry, <laughs> sorry. But then one of the other three passengers on this water taxi, so there were three passengers and the driver and then Olivia and Ben. So one of these other three passengers spoke up and said, well, I'm about to go back to my yacht to sleep on there. You guys come with, you can stay on my yacht. Well, actually he originally said it in a lot more sleazy way than that. He actually said to Olivia, he was like, yeah, you can stay, but he can't point into Ben. He eventually just like brushed it off. He's like, no, 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 I'm joking. You can both stay. But that's, that's so creepy. I wouldn't have wanted to stay with him after that. But regardless, they did. Olivia and Ben were just happy to have a bed to sleep in that night. And so the water taxi guy took them over to this guy's boat and all three of them went to get off. And before they did, this water taxi guy actually asked Ben and Olivia once again, you know, are you all right with this? Are you, do you want to go and sleep on here? And they were like, yeah, sure, it's fine. He double checked with them because he knew that they were all drunk. It was New Year's. And Olivia and Ben seemed a little bit younger than this guy. And it was clear that he was just a brand new stranger that they'd literally just met like two minutes ago. So yeah, the water taxi guy double checked and Olivia and Ben seemed fine with it. So he drove them to this guy's boat. All three of them got off. And then the water taxi guy went and dropped off the other two couple, the, the other two couple, the other two people that were a couple that he had on the water taxi and then he ended up going back to Ferno Lodge and that was it for New Year's Eve. The next morning Amelia and all of her friends woke up on the Tamarack and there's no Olivia but they knew there was going to be no Olivia because they knew she'd gone off somewhere else and found somewhere else to sleep. So they all start getting ready that morning, they're all packing their bags, they're all getting ready to take this boat back to the people that they loaned it off and they still don't know where Olivia is. There's no way of really contacting her and she hasn't turned back up at the Tamarack and they don't really know what to do. Right now they were thinking she'd probably found somewhere else to sleep and so she'd probably found another way home. You know, she'd probably jumped on a on a boat home with someone. They didn't know how she'd gotten home, but it, she must have, she must have. As the day went on, the girls still hadn't heard or seen from Olivia and it was getting to the time where they really needed to be taking this boat back. It wasn't their boat, they'd hired it for 24 hours or something around that. They'd, they'd only hired it for this party and they needed to take it back, they needed to get home. And so they were thinking, Olivia's surely found her own way home by now. Let's just all go home, take this boat back and then we'll try and get in contact with her from there. So that's exactly what they did. When Amelia got home home later that night to her mum and dad's house, she told them that she didn't know where Olivia was and that she hadn't seen her since the night before, but she was with this guy, Ben, and they'd gone and found somewhere else to stay and now like she doesn't really know where her sister is and she can't get hold of her. No one was worried, worried at this point in time. Like, of course they were worried. They didn't know where she was, but they weren't scared for her safety, if you know what I mean. She'd been with this guy and they trusted this guy. They didn't think any harm had come to her, but they just, they didn't know where she was. And that's a worrying thing, of course. So that night her family did like all the usual things that you would do if you were trying to find a loved one, called around all her friends, tried to get a hold of her somehow, but they just couldn't. And then the next morning rolled around. Now it was January 2nd. She hadn't been seen for a day and a half at this point and her parents decided it was time to report Olivia Hope as missing. And by now, Ben Smart's parents had also reported him as missing because they'd gotten in touch with his friends. His friends said they hadn't seen him since just after midnight on New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. And again, he hadn't shown up home either. So both sets of these parents had reported their children as missing and the police force very quickly connected the two because 
they were at the same party. All it takes is just asking one of these two people's friends and they'd be like, oh yeah, Ben and Olivia knew each other. They also had just a load of witness testimonies that said they'd seen Ben and Olivia together at the party, they'd seen them leaving together at the end of the night, and then as soon as police spoke to Amelia and all of Olivia's friends, they knew that that's who she was gonna be spending the night with when she left and they tried to find other accommodation. So police start doing a load of public appeals to these party goers for any information, asking them if they'd seen Olivia and Ben or if they'd seen them leaving at any point and if anyone could come forward with any information, please do. But no one really did. Like no one actually had anything useful to tell police. They'd just been partying. Everyone was really drunk. It was New Year's Eve, so like, People, people hadn't seen anything. So the next thing police tried was questioning all the staff that had worked the Ferno Lodge party because barmen probably saw them and police managed to identify that barman that had become like a substitute water taxi driver that night. His name was Guy Wallace. It was a guy called Guy. And he told police everything that had gone down on the water taxi that night, that Ben and Olivia found their accommodation full, they had nowhere to sleep, so they got back in his taxi and that was when this stranger, this other man, offered them a place to stay. They accepted it and so he took them all to this guy's boat and that was the last time he saw them. Ben and Olivia hadn't been seen since then. So if that isn't the most suspicious thing police could hear in a missing persons case, that they had literally gone home with a stranger and that is the last time they'd ever been seen. That sounds like the biggest lead that they were gonna get. And that immediately made them suspect foul play in Ben and Olivia's disappearance. Up until this point, they thought the two of them had just gone missing after a party and maybe they would turn up a few days from now after having some kind of like wild drunken adventure. But no, now that they knew that they had gone off with a stranger at the end of the night and never been seen since, it seemed that this stranger could have had a hand in their disappearance and most likely did. Police feared that Ben and Olivia might have already met a tragic fate. Maybe they had already lost their lives the night that they went missing. On January 5th, so they were only about three days into the investigation, if that, because the investigation started halfway through the day on the 2nd of January. So this is still very, very early on. The case was passed on to a new detective inspector named Rob Pope, and he officially switched this investigation from a missing persons inquiry to a homicide investigation. He believed that they were looking for Ben and Olivia's bodies. So one of the first things that was done now that this was a murder investigation, they sent out a bunch of divers all the way through that kind of area of the Marlborough Sounds to see if they could honestly find their bodies. That was what they were looking for at this point in time or just any kind of evidence, a murder weapon or ditched evidence, anything. But they found absolutely nothing, nothing of use came up in these dives. I forgot to mention as well, when this case was taken over by Rob Pope, it was nicknamed Operation Tam which is short for Tamarack. So, the next thing police did in this investigation was speak to Guy Wallace at length, since he was the last person to see Ben and Olivia, and he was the one that saw this suspect, well, who, who they're considering a suspect, they don't even know anything about this mystery guy on the boat. So Guy Wallace gave as much of a description of this guy and his boat that they ended up getting onto as he possibly could. He said that the, the, the guy, who is nicknamed in this case as just the mystery guy, so if you hear me talking about mystery guy, it's him. He was supposedly a little bit older than Ben and Olivia. He had long, dark, like, wavy, shaggy, kind of messy hair. The words that are used to describe the mystery man are unkempt, scruffy, messy. He seemed like he just was not freshly showered and shaven. You know what I mean? Apparently he had a little bit of a stubbly situation going on. Whether it was intentional or whether he just genuinely was a scruffy person, we don't know. But that's the kind of description that's given of this guy. And then his boat was supposedly like quite a big boat. It was a catch, which is a boat that has two sails on it. Apparently it was in really, really good condition as well. It seemed like a really nice boat. It was well painted. It had like a blue stripe all the way around it. And it had big brass portholes, you know, those like circular windows on boats. It was a really nice boat. The, the water taxi guy remembered looking at this boat and thinking, oh, nice. So they have a description of the guy that Ben and Olivia were last seen with. And they have a description of the boat that they were seen getting onto. So police take these two descriptions and they start putting them out on all the public appeals. Like, have you seen this guy? Have you seen this boat lately? Do you remember seeing this guy at the party? All these questions. And rather quickly, police identified their first suspect, 26 year old Scott Watson. Scott had been in attendance at the Ferno Lodge party that night on New Year's Eve. And he also happened 
to own his own boat. Scott Watson had been into boats ever since he was a little boy. Like his whole family are into boats. So he was like raised with it. Him and his sister Sandy, apparently they used to go out on the boats all the time. They even lived on a boat for a little bit as teenagers. Their parents sold their house and got a boat. So they'd spent all their childhoods around boats. And when Scott was a bit older, he decided he wanted his own boat, but he wasn't just gonna go out and buy one. He wanted to make, build his own boat. And so he taught himself how to weld. He didn't know how to go about making a boat. He taught himself it all from scratch. Taught himself how to weld, got all these pieces of metal and made his own damn boat. And this boat was Scott Watson's pride and joy. He nicknamed it Blade and he would take Blade out nearly every single day. He was always just sailing on it. He really liked fishing so he would go out into the water and just sit fishing off the boat all day. And he actually took Blade to the party on New Year's Eve. So that's why police were mainly suspicious of him because well, to be fair, they were suspicious of loads of boat owners at that party that night. They were all suspects. But when you see Scott Watson's boat, Blade, it's nothing like what Guy Wallace described as the boat that Ben and Olivia got onto. Blade is what's known as a sloop boat, not a catch. I don't... You know what? I didn't know any of these boat terms before this video, but now I feel like a nautical goddess. So Scott's boat was a sloop, which means it has one sail. A catch has two. Guy Wallace said that the boat that Ben and Olivia got on had two sails. Okay, so that's already our first discrepancy. Blade was made of metal. Remember, Scott taught himself to weld metal to be able to build this boat, whereas the one that Guy Wallace saw was wooden. The one that Wallace saw had a big blue stripe around it. It had those portholes neither of which were on Blade. In fact, Blade was white and red at the time of New Year's Eve. Honestly, they sound like completely different boats. Do they not? Do they not? I don't want to be biased, but objectively, those are two different boats. Those are two different boats. But police were still quite caught up on Scott Watson as a suspect for other reasons other than the boat at this point in time. So let's talk about those. So of course they'd been trying to get as many witness statements from this party as they possibly could. They'd called in everyone that thought they remembered seeing or speaking to Scott that night. And there were a lot of unpleasant interactions that he had had that night. Scott Watson was very drunk on New Year's Eve and he was known to get ob obnoxious in all kinds of ways when he was drunk. So for example, there was this lad that he was speaking to at one of the bars and he noticed this lad was wearing a pearl necklace. So he starts grabbing it and making fun of it and going, oh, you gay, you a woman. And this lad was like, no, it's my sister's, she's dying of cancer. And then and then I think Scott Watson even made like a, a joke back at that about this sister with cancer. Couldn't find his exact wording, but I think he did make a joke about that again. Just a really, really unpleasant guy. And it doesn't even stop there. He was so pervy with women all night as well. There were multiple different reports of sexual harassment from Scott Watson. Just him like shouting things at girls, telling them to show their tits and stuff like that. And then there was one woman who he even sexually assaulted he grabbed a part of her body. I don't know which part has been differently reported. It's either a boobs or a bum. He grabbed her. And again, it doesn't even stop there because later on in the night, in the early hours of the morning, once most people had gone to bed, there's another report of Scott Watson. So this, this couple were just like asleep in their boat. And then they wake up in the middle of the night to see Scott Watson standing in their doorway of their boat, just staring at them, just watching them sleep. And so they're like, uh, hello? What? Hello? What do you want? Turns out Scott wasn't trying to do anything weird. He just didn't want the party to end and he was just trying to wake people up out of their boats so that he had someone to keep drinking and talking with. And this couple were like, no, piss off. Like they, they genuinely swore at him and told him to get away. And so he did. He left them alone to sleep. The couple said that they heard Scott climb across the boats because he was only two boats down from them. So there was just one in between them. They said they heard him climb across that boat, climb into his own boat, and then they didn't hear him again for the rest of the night. He'd gone to bed. So the lead detective on Operation Tam, like I said, is Rob Pope. And from the very beginning, when he was first put on this case, he said he had a really bad gut feeling about Scott Watson. His exact words actually were that he stood out like dog's balls. And one of the main reasons he thought this was actually because of Scott Watson's criminal history. They'd looked him up on the system and found that Scott had 48 previous convictions. 
48 is a hell of a lot. And these were for things like theft, burglary, robbery, assault, possession of a weapon. He'd even been sent to juvenile prison on two separate occasions for a few months at a time when he was young, when he was a teenager. And all of that sounds really, really bad for Scott Watson, doesn't it? 48 previous convictions, prison twice. But when you hear that 47 of these 48 convictions, all of them but one, were done in his teenage years. And he was 26 at the time of this case. So a lot of people look at that, look at his criminal history and think, okay, this guy went down a really bad path when he was a teenager, committed a lot of petty crimes, but then sorted himself out in adulthood. He had committed one crime in the last six years. As of turning 20 years old, he had committed one offence. And I don't even know what that was. It wasn't one of his more severe ones either. In fact, his most severe conviction was the assault one that I mentioned earlier. And even then, it was a mutual drunk fight with another man. When you first hear assault, you think, oh, he's like maliciously attacked someone out of nowhere, you know? But it, it, it wasn't that case. It was a mutual fight where they were both fighting each other. I bet they both got assault charges in that. So you can kind of understand where Rob Pope came from at first because 48 convictions and twice in prison looks horrible on paper. It looks like this man is just violent, aggressive, scary, dangerous. But when you actually look into it and you look at all the context, most of his convictions, a lot of them were even drugs charges, like marijuana possession. That, that to me, does not equal murderer. I don't know, the, the, you, you can't, like, discount his history at all, because 47 is a hell of a lot. That is effing crazy. For a teenager as well, 48 crimes over and over again, you're getting caught by police. Yeah, Rob Pope didn't really care what those convictions were for. He just saw those convictions, and he already had a bad feeling about Scott Watson. And so, following this, he ordered for Scott to be brought into the police station for questioning and his boat to be seized for like searching. And it wasn't just Scott Watson that was brought to the police station. They actually brought his sister Sandy as well. I don't know if Sandy was younger or older than him, but they were relatively close in age because they spent a lot of time together. They'd actually been out sailing together for a few days after New Year's. So like the first few days of January, they'd been out together on Scott's boat, on Blade. So that was the main reason that they wanted to speak to Sandy. They actually questioned her for nine hours, just asking her like about this boat and about the layout and about things that she'd seen on it had she noticed anything weird on that boat you know all that kind of stuff and she hadn't she she was saying no there is nothing weird going on with my brother but in scott's questioning they were going in on him they'd already in their heads decided that scott watson was guilty and so in his interrogation in one of his first ever questionings they're asking him what did you do to these people where are they like like really accusatory questions demanding questions and he's like I don't even know them. I don't even know Ben Smart and Olivia Hope. I'd never heard of them before this. Scott denied absolutely every accusation made against him. Like I say, he said he didn't even know who they were. He said he'd been at the Ferno Lodge party and at about 3 a.m. he'd got on the water taxi back to his boat, then decided he didn't really wanna go to bed. So he tried to wake up the people on the neighboring boats, like the ones that he was tethered to. No one wanted to party with him. And so he just walked back to his boat and went to bed. And that was the last time that couple heard him clambering about the boats. So eventually police let Scott and Sandy go because they weren't like officially arrested. They weren't like, I don't know, they couldn't actually keep them there. They just had them there for an initial questioning. At this point, police really wanted to arrest Scott Watson, I think. I think they'd already made their minds up, but they couldn't because they didn't have any evidence against him. So that was what they were trying to do now. They were trying to get that evidence. In order to do this, they decided to bug Scott's house, his parents' house, and his boat, because he he kind of mostly lived on his boat, Blade, but if he was gonna sleep on land, it would be at his parents' house. So they bugged both the boat and the house, and they were listening into conversations for months, genuinely months, because that's how long they couldn't get evidence against this guy. They were trying for months and months and months, and they honestly got nothing. If anything, they only got reinforcement that Scott was innocent because he was telling everyone the details of how he'd gone to bed at 3am and like he was just telling his story. 
his version of events over and over again to everyone that was asking about them anyway in these bugged tapes. And it was the same every single time. He recounted every detail the exact same over and over again. So for a second, let's just zoom out of this case and have a bit of a perspective look on this. So we have Guy Wallace, the water taxi guy who literally saw Ben and Olivia for the last time ever. He saw them leave with this mystery man that he has described to police as having like long scruffy hair. He also said that he saw them get onto a catch with two sails, a really big boat painted with a blue stripe with portholes. He told police exactly what he saw that night. But for some reason, police are now focusing on a suspect that doesn't match that physical description at all. Scott Watson had short, dark hair that was pretty well kept, honestly. He didn't have facial hair. He wasn't scruffy by any means. And his boat was completely different to what Guy Wallace had described. It was way smaller, didn't have any portholes, didn't have space for portholes, had one sail on it. Like, it, everything is completely different to the leads and the evidence that police are getting from witnesses they just seem to be turning a blind eye and going with whatever else they want to do. And honestly, Guy Wallace was getting really frustrated in this case. He felt like police weren't listening to him. They weren't they weren't paying attention to what he was saying to them. He was like, no, I don't think it was Scott Watson. It was this guy that had long hair. Trust me, I'm saying this. But they were like, nah, we think you've remembered it wrong. It's definitely Scott Watson. There was even a picture that was found of Scott on New Year's Eve, like before the struck, the struck? Before the clock struck midnight. There's a picture of him with all his mates on this boat. And in this picture, you can even see that he is pretty clean shaven. He has like short, well-kept hair. He does not look anything like the mystery man that Guy Wallace described. And there's proof that he didn't look like that on the night because there's always the chance that he could have cut his hair and shaved after committing the crime. But this is proof that he didn't. This is proof that he looked like that the whole time. Oh, and not only that, police had also managed to speak to the other couple that was in the water taxi that night. So remember there was Guy Wallace, the driver, there was Ben and Olivia, then there was the mystery man that they went off with. And then there was another couple on that boat, just a boy and a girl that were just trying to find their boat to sleep in that night. And they were also questioned by police and they said, absolutely not. It wasn't Scott Watson that they left with that night. They were shown a picture of Scott Watson and they said, no, that's not the guy from the water taxi. That's not the mystery man. But for some reason, despite having so many people saying, you're on the wrong tracks, please listen to us, please follow these leads that we're giving you, police weren't listening to that. They were dead set on convicting Scott Watson for this. They already thought they had their guy and they were just looking for things to confirm that. I don't know because it is kind of understandable from police's point of view that they have had a lot of witness testimonies of Scott Watson that are confirmed to be of Scott Watson of him being a complete shit guy that night at the party. He was a horrible guy when he drank. He had harassed loads of women. He had sexually assaulted one of them. He'd been homophobic towards this guy at the bar. Like he had been an absolute nuisance all night on New Year's Eve. No one really liked him. But with all that being said, just because he was a shit guy treating people like shit all night, does that mean he was a murderer? I don't know. When that is the only evidence to say that he's a murderer, that coupled with like actual physical evidence, I'd say, yeah, sure. But right now that's the only evidence. He doesn't look like the described suspect. His boat doesn't match the described boat. All police have to go on is the fact that he was a dickhead at the party. And honestly, with a party of like 1,500 people, you're bound to have at least a few dickheads in there. But like I said, does that make them all murderers? I don't know, you would have to look into further evidence to be able to prove that they're a murderer and not just a shit guy. But they're not really looking into this case as much as they should be. And they're not following the right paths either. Honestly, I personally believe there was a little bit of personal beef in this. And this is only my, my thoughts and theories. None of this is fact, it's all alleged. But, <laughs> so you know when they bugged Scott's house, his parents' house? Well, his family hated Detective Rob Pope for obvious reasons. He was very accusatory of their son and like they were ruining their son's life over what they deemed to be nothing. They believed he was innocent and so they believed that Rob Pope was just a twat. So now that their house was bugged, 
the family would bitch about Rob Pope quite a bit. They would slag him off. They would say that he was bad at his job and that they wished he would just like give up or whatever. And he heard all of this. He heard them bitching about him through the bugs in the house. And he couldn't really do anything about it because it's not evidence for the investigation. It's just a bit of a bit of an ego bruise moment to hear that, isn't it, I guess? And so some people think and theorise, me maybe being one of them, that maybe there might have been a bit of personal beef here. Maybe he just did not like Scott Watson after hearing all of this shit that they were saying about him in the house. I don't think that's like the full and only reason, but I think that possibly has a bit of a factor because... Rob Pope. I don't know, you'll you'll hear more as we go on with this case. I don't really like Rob Pope. Soon into the investigation, the police announced that they were no longer looking for this mystery catch. You know, the boat that they were seen getting onto that night with the two sails and the blue stripe. They said they were no longer looking for that because they believed that Guy Wallace had just remembered it wrong. They think that this two sail catch doesn't even exist and that, ro and that the water taxi guy must have just seen it wrong. They even went public with this doubt and they told the public, this catch probably didn't exist. We're not looking for it anymore. And Guy Wallace was so pissed off at that because he'd been saying to them literally for months at this point, listen to me, listen, I'm telling you the truth. This is what I saw this night and I feel like you're not, actually giving it any credit. And this was literally just a slap in the face to Guy Watson that police were publicly saying, don't listen to this guy's version of events. We're gonna solve it anyway. It made Guy Wallace really, really mad that they weren't listening to him because he'd literally driven alongside this boat. How could he forget what it looks like? He had driven Olivia and Ben right up to this boat, had even given them a foot up to get onto this boat because this two sail catch, quite a big boat, they needed a foot up to it because it was higher than the water taxi. Whereas Blade, Scott Watson's actual boat, was not that big. They would have been able to just step over onto the blade if it was the blade, but I don't think it was. It was this bigger two sail catch that he, like there was that much effort that went into getting Ben and Olivia onto this boat that Guy Wallace obviously remembered it. It stuck out in his memory. But for police to now tell him, we think you're remembering that wrong, like, it just, it was such a punch in the face. Especially because there had actually been other sightings of this catch by other people. It wasn't just Guy Wallace that had seen this two sail blue stripe catch. Apparently it had just been sailing around Marlborough Sounds for like a couple of days after that. And loads of people had called in to tell police because they said that that's what they were looking for. And a couple of these reports even claim they saw a young couple sitting on that boat and it was being sailed by an older scruffy looking man. Multiple reports of that exact same three people on a blue two sail catch, like, if there's multiple reports, listen to them. They even said that the girl had blonde hair. Did I say that? The girl had blonde hair, the guy had short cropped hair and there was a scruffy man driving the boat. So how can police deny the existence of this catch entirely and say that Guy Wallace remembered it wrong if multiple people saw that catch in that like area. I don't, ah, this case is so frustrating. And honestly, that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the dodgy police work in this case. Should we talk about some more things? Let's talk about some more things. I don't even know where to start because there's just a lot of, this is why this case is so controversial. It's because of the police work in it. There were a lot of allegations of either bribery or police putting pressure on um, witnesses to give certain statements to say certain things in their statements, allegedly. So for example, a few of the people that had called in to say that they'd seen the catch just after New Year's Day, they were saying that they'd seen it in the beginning, da 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 da, and then later on in the investigation, when it came to court and these witnesses were called up, they said, oh, actually, I don't remember seeing that. A lot of them went back on themselves or changed their story or then decided that they suddenly doubted their memory of that night and maybe they were too drunk so maybe they saw it wrong. A lot of people went back on seeing that catch specifically for some reason, which is odd, but even the catch witnesses are not the only instance of people seeming to have changed their story as this case had gone on. So for this next one, you'll need a little bit of pretext. So. On New Year's Day, the morning after the party, Scott Watson wakes up in his boat, the Blade, and decides that he's gonna get ready and sail off to go and meet one of his friends that lived in the nearby area. So he goes to this friend's house and he spends a couple of days there with him. And while he was there, he actually painted his boat. It had been red and white on New Year's Eve. And then from New Year's Day forward, he painted it blue. And one thing about this friend that he was there visiting, this friend 
was growing weed. A lot of it. And he was selling it which is all very much illegal in New Zealand. Now this is where the police come into it because Scott Watson himself believes that maybe police had found his friend's weed farm and then struck a deal with him. The theory goes that maybe police were gonna turn a blind eye to the weed farm that they'd just found if Scott's friend agreed to lie about the time at which Scott arrived at his house on New Year's Day. So Scott had actually arrived there at noon. That's what he says. He says he woke up that morning, New Year's Day, was really hungover, so kind of like took himself a while to get ready and set off. And then he arrived at his friend's farm at about midday, noon, 12 o'clock, midday, right? But now this friend, much later on in the case, said that Scott didn't arrive at the farm until 5 p.m. which in police's eyes gave Scott Watson enough time to have murdered Ben and Olivia, disposed of their bodies, cleaned up in whatever way he needed to and then he will have arrived at his friends at 5 p.m. This friend changing his story meant that there was just a huge chunk of Scott's New Year's Day that was unaccounted for and police really kind of used that against him. They were like, well, what could he have been doing in this five hours? Even though we don't actually know that there was that five hours of free time. He could have been at his friend's. It's just his word against his friend's word, I suppose. So we don't know what's actually the truth, but this is what Scott says he thinks has happened. He thinks that his friend was pressured by police to change that story. Also, police really clung to the fact that he had painted his boat on New Year's Day, which I kind of understand. They were like, oh, he's trying to disguise his boat. He's trying to make it look different. So then we can't trace it, da 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 da. But he painted it blue. He painted it literally the color that they were looking for. If he was smart and if that's what he was trying to do, if he was trying to disguise the boat, wouldn't you paint it fucking the complete opposite? I would paint it rainbow. But this is what I don't really understand about this point from police is that like, oh, they he painted his boat. He's trying to disguise it. What, from red and white the night before? He was, a Blade was red and white on New Year's Eve, which is the complete opposite again of what Guy Wallace described. The boat that Olivia and Ben got onto was white with a blue stripe. I don't know, for some reason, police were trying to argue that he was disguising his butt. He was trying to disguise it. He had painted it. He'd also taken off the, the weather vane. You know them things that like point in like four directions? Jack, put a picture on. I don't know how to describe a weather vane. One of them. He'd also taken that off and police were saying, oh, this is him trying to make his butt look different. But realistically, the paint we've already talked about, that's stupid, shut up. The weather vane, how much of a difference would that make to the overall appearance of a boat? I don't think that would be what made me recognise a boat over anything else. I don't know. I don't know. But Scott said the weather vane was just broken. So he just took it off. Like, that's his house. He lived in that boat. So if something's broken, he's going to see to it. He's not just going to leave it there for ages. Oh, also, there's even proof that Scott had been planning to paint his boat blue well before New Year's Eve. His mate had gotten all the paint in ready for him because it takes a lot of blooming blue paint to paint a whole boat. So his friend had ordered it all into the farm. So then that was the plan that he was gonna go there on New Year's and paint his boat. This had been planned ahead of time. It wasn't like a, a split decision like, crap, I've just murdered two people on New Year's Eve. Let me go paint my boat and disguise it. There were a few other things that police clung to about Scott's boat in particular. So they sent in like a forensic team to go and search the whole thing. They were doing fingerprint searches and all that. And the team that did the searches reported back to the actual main police team that Scott seemed to have cleaned his boat in, in the days prior, which to be fair, it does sound a bit suspicious. He has been accused of a crime and his house is very clean in the days after. But when this case eventually went to court, the fingerprint guy that noted this down, that the house was very clean, was called up to the stand and he was like, it's not as clean as people are making it out though. It's not like he'd like gone in and bleached all the surfaces and stuff. This fingerprint guy said that about 30% of the surface area in that house seemed to have been like properly, properly cleaned. Whereas like 70% of it was just normal lived in house kind of vibe. You know what I mean? He'd only properly wiped down like 30% of the surfaces, which is just what you do in a house, I think personally. I, I don't know, that's what clean people do clean the house. So I don't know, wiping down 30% of his surfaces does not seem like evidence to me that he was trying to clean up the aftermath of a double murder. But that's what they were trying to say, that he had potentially had Ben and Olivia in his boat, maybe even killed them there. And then he tried to clean up the crime scene, but 
if he had actually tried to clean up a crime scene, like bleach and blood and everything, there would be some kind of evidence there, surely. Scott's sister, Sandy, has been quoted saying that this, talking about like the cleanliness of the boat, was just another little ploy by the police to make everything look sinister when in actual fact, Scott was just a clean person. There was another thing about the boat that police kind of clung to in the beginning as well. He had this hatch, you know, the thing that, um, oh, you know a hatch on a boat? How do I describe this? The little trap door on the top of the boat that allows you to go into the bottom. So the hatch, um, this apparently had a load of scratches on it, like along the edge. And police's initial impression of this was, oh my God, this must have been Ben and Olivia locked in the bottom of this boat trying to claw their way out. And then as soon as Scott heard this, he was like, no, like those scratches have always been there. Turns out that when Scott is in the bottom of the boat and he's trying to get like air into the bottom, he will just prop up in the hatch with a stick. And obviously it's a stick. It doesn't have like smooth edges. It's scratched it over time. He's done this so many times that it's all, it is all scratched up. And besides, if Ben and Olivia were locked in the bottom of the boat, First of all, the hatch doesn't lock, so they would have literally been able to just push it up and gotten out. They wouldn't have needed to like claw at it. And plus there were so many things in the bottom of the boat that Scott said, had they needed to try and escape, they would have been able to use some sort of weapon to get themselves out. Maybe not a weapon, but use something as a weapon to be able to like, get at this hatch if they were locked in there. But it doesn't seem like they were. Oh, and another alleged dodgy police thing that happened actually quite earlier on in the case. I probably should have mentioned this before now, but anyway. So obviously Guy Wallace was the last person to see Ben and Olivia alive and they were leaving with this mystery stranger. So they asked Wallace to make a police sketch of this mystery man, this scruffy man. So he sat down with the artist and basically the way that they do it or the way that they did it in this case was that he was shown like eight different chins and he had to pick the one that he thought was this guy's chin, eight different noses, eight different sets of eyes, you know, he just had to piece together all these features that he thought was this guy. So he, he chose out all these features and then they put it all together in one final sketch and gave it to him and he was like, that don't actually look like the guy. Can we do it again? Like, I need another go. That's that's not accurate. And allegedly, police told him, no, we don't have enough time. So can you just sign off on this one? We need to get it out. Even though it was inaccurate, even though Guy Wallace, the guy that had literally seen the suspect was saying, this don't look like the suspect. They were like, Shh, we just need to get it out. Like, just sign off on it. Apparently the hair was way too short. The hair needed to be longer, scruffier. Like there were a lot of things that were just off about this picture. Guy was even more pissed off with them putting out this picture because they just were not listening to him at any point. There's just a lot of dodgy goings on by the looks of things in this case and if they are all true then it certainly looks like evidence is being manipulated to reach some sort of conclusion. Maybe a conclusion that police had wanted to reach from the very beginning, who knows? So up until now, all of this evidence against Scott Watson has all been circumstantial. It's all just people's word and witnesses and you know, this part on his boat seems a little bit suspicious, but no like actual physical evidence that makes you look at this guy and go, oh yeah, he he's definitely a murderer. Because right now you could look at him and just be like, Seems like a bit of a weird guy, a bit of a dick at the party when he's had a drink, but like, he doesn't seem like a murderer. That was until they actually found their first piece of physical evidence. In the search of his boat, Blade, police had found a tiger blanket in his bedroom. It, it's referred to as the tiger blanket in this case. It's just got a big tiger's head on it. And they recovered this blanket and they took it in for forensic testing and they found loads of hairs all over it. It was a, it was a hair catcher kind of blanket. So they pulled all these hairs off, put them all into Ziploc bags and then they were gonna be sent to a lab for some poor scientist to go through and painstakingly look at each individual hair to see if they could find any that might have belonged to Olivia or to Ben. So this blanket was collected and all the hairs were tested for the very first time in late January. There were 400 hairs in total and they were practically all just like little brown ones that are believed to have been from Scott Watson. In this first search, absolutely nothing was found. They were just 400 little brown hairs, nothing, nothing suspicious. And so they put the Ziploc bags away, carried on with the investigation. And then like another two months later in March, they were like, hmm, maybe we should go back and look at those hairs. I don't know, maybe we didn't look hard enough. So they get the hairs back out and they do another search. And somehow this time in the second search, 
They found something. Somehow, right? She So she'd completely missed them the first time. And then she's told to go back and look again at these hairs. And all of a sudden, there's two big, long, blonde hairs in there. In a pile of 400 short, little brown hairs, there's these two long, blonde hairs that are like 20 centimetres long that somehow she'd missed the first time. She must have just, she must have just not seen them. How? How? How is that possible? The hairs were tested and they were confirmed to be Olivia Hope's hairs. Two of Olivia Hope's hairs had been found on Blade in in Scott Watson's bed, in his blanket. So this, to police, was proof, it was evidence that Olivia and Scott had been together at least on the night of the party and most likely that she'd been on that boat. But that might not actually be the case. And it's not often that you'll hear me trying to disprove physical evidence like hairs on my channel. But wait for this, wait for this. It already seemed quite suspicious that this forensic lady had gone through all 400 of these hairs in January and not found a single thing. But then somehow two months later, there's two big long blonde hairs in there that she never saw. To me, how the hell does that happen? How does that happen? I'm immediately raising an eyebrow at that situation as soon as I heard it. And then when it went to court, it was, it was revealed that I was right to raise an eyebrow, if I do say so myself. Turns out that this forensic lady that had been testing the hairs, she also had a separate Ziploc bag with Olivia's actual hair in it. Hair that they'd gotten from her bedroom. They'd gotten it out of like her hairbrush or whatever. So that they had reference hairs so that this forensic person could look at the length and like how shiny it was and the thickness and all this kind of stuff. So she knew what she was looking for in these other Ziploc bags of the crime scene hairs. And obviously at this point in March, when she comes to do the second search, it had been like two months since she'd done the initial search. So to refresh her memory of Olivia Hope's hair, this forensic lady gets out the reference bag, she looks at all these hairs, then she puts Olivia's hairs away. She gets out the crime scene hairs, and oh my God, there's two blonde hairs in them, what? Well, it was found later on that the bag of Olivia's reference hairs actually had a hole in it. There was a hole in the bottom of this bag. And honestly, to me, it looks intentionally done. It wasn't like a wear and tear hole. It wasn't like a rip in the bag. It looks honestly like a scissor snip. Scissor snip. So what is believed to have happened here is that some hairs somehow fell out of this hole in the reference hair bag got onto the desk and then she went and got out the crime scene hairs, put the crime scene hairs on the desk and there was still Olivia Hope hairs on the desk and she was like, oh, that must be, you know. But also, I'm doubting it. I just think if you are a professional forensic scientist, how the fuck are you mixing up two bags of hairs? I just find it very convenient that there was a scissor snip in the bottom. I don't know. I don't know what, I, I don't know. Alleged, alleged. I don't know, I get scared when I'm like, conspiring about things. I'm like, oh, it's all alleged. What's annoying is that the amount of reference hairs in that bag were never counted. Like in the beginning, they didn't know how many of Olivia's hairs they actually had in that bag. So it's not like they can count them again and be like, oh yeah, there's two missing. So they must be the two. You know what I mean? They didn't know how, there's no way to prove whether those hairs were from the reference bag or from the boat. What a roller coaster that piece of evidence is because when you first hear that Olivia Hope's hairs were found on his boat, that seems like such strong evidence that they've got him. Scott Watson must be the killer. But then you hear about the forensic lab mishap and it's like, oh, well, there's no weight behind that evidence at all then. It could be true. It could, it could be real evidence, but because of the forensic lab stress, then it's not really considered evidence now. So despite the evidence against Scott Watson being honestly very weak, he was still arrested and charged on suspicion of a double murder of both Ben and Olivia. So the case went to trial and all of the evidence that we've just discussed was presented and both sides were having a full on debate because it is just like circumstantial evidence against each other. So it's just like an argument, isn't it? There's no like actual cold hard facts and proof and evidence. It's literally just a debate between both sides because there really was so much to argue about. I don't think I've covered a case with so much conflicting evidence 
in so long. Like, there was just so much that was coming up and then getting disproven and coming up and getting disproven. In the trial, there were hundreds of witnesses brought up to give some kind of statement against Scott Watson. Whether they'd seen him that night at the party, interacted him that with him that night at the party, there were a lot of those. A lot of people had unpleasant experiences with him that night, honestly. And then there were just a lot of people just from his real life to come and give, like, character... Character statements? What are they called? Character... Character witness? I don't know. They just basically went to say what kind of guy Scott was and that he would never do anything like this. But these witness statements are kind of the only thing that they really had against Scott Watson. And they were really bad, honestly. Like, especially from the night of the party, he had been a shit guy to a lot of people. And I don't want this to sound defensive of him at all, but I think it's quite important to, to consider the context in which he was a shit guy. Pretty much everything he did that night was verbal. The most physical thing he did was grab that woman's boobs or a bum, which is fucking awful, don't get me wrong. But it wasn't like he was getting in fights with guys. He wasn't aggressive or violent. He was just being a dick just a perv, just, you know, just a horrible drunk man. You know what I mean? It's quite a different vibe to someone that you would consider to maybe go out and commit murder that same night. You know, to me, he just seems like a drunk prick. I could be wrong. I could very much be wrong. And police do think I'm wrong. Um, but that's kind of the only thing that they really had against Scott Watson. All of their other evidence of like the scratched up, uh, hatch and loads of stuff like that. All that could be disproven really, couldn't it? But despite that, at the end of his trial, Scott Watson was actually found guilty of the murders of Olivia Hope and Ben Smart. No bodies were ever found. Still, to this day, we have no remains of either Olivia or Ben. And there's not even been any proof that they were murdered. There's been no blood, there's been no Possessions found, absolutely nothing has been found that confirms that these two people are dead. It's literally just the time that's gone by that, I mean, they must be, they must be. You would really like to think that they're not, but in cases like this, that is most often the outcome. If they've been missing for over 20 years now, and they haven't been seen or heard from since, it's more than likely that they are deceased. But still, this man was found guilty of both of their murders. And actually, when his verdict was read out, Scott screamed back at the person reading it saying, you're wrong. But the decision was made. And so Scott Watson was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 17 years before he will be eligible for parole. This is a very, very controversial case over in New Zealand. A lot of people think that the wrong man has been sentenced, that this is is a miscarriage of justice. Don't get me wrong, a lot of people also think that he is guilty. It's a very polarizing case, especially over there in New Zealand. But many people think that Scott will likely never be released from prison. And that's because in order to be let out for parole after his 17 years, criminals, murderers, have to show some sort of remorse. They have to show reformation that they've changed, that they won't go back out into society and do that exact same thing again. But the only problem with Scott Watson's case is because he is so adamant that he didn't do it, they're not gonna get any remorse out of him. They're not gonna get any reformation because he's not gonna admit to a murder that he didn't do. But the only way to get let out on parole is if he does admit and does show remorse, which he doesn't wanna do, you know? So unless some new kind of evidence comes out and he can be like physically proven to have not murdered them, or maybe physical proof comes out that they died in a different kind of way, then I think that's the only way that Scott Watson will be released from prison. And I think the only way that we're gonna get that kind of evidence is if Olivia and Ben's remains are found. Although, like I said, it's been over 20 years since then. I think the chances of finding their remains are very, very unlikely. But actually, one one last little frustrating police story to round off this case, because there hasn't been enough in this video, has there? In 1999, so like just over a year and a bit after the disappearances took place, divers found a human skull in the waters of Marlborough Sounds. This skull, as far as I'm aware, has never been like properly, properly forensically tested, but it has been examined and it's been determined to be that of a young white female. But like I say, it hasn't been properly, properly forensically tested. So they haven't um, even looked into the possibility that this could be Olivia Hope, even though to me, 
That seems like a really good lead, does it not? You have just found human remains in an area where a young girl went missing and it's looking like it's a young girl's remains. Why not just test it and get a yes or no answer? What if they have found Olivia's remains and that could lead to Scott Watson's release, but because they don't want to test it, Scott's still rotting in prison when a lot of people believe that he shouldn't be there. This is just a very, very frustrating case on so many levels, mainly with the police work. I think whether you believe Scott is guilty or innocent, I think the police did quite a shoddy job here. That's my own personal opinion. If you want my take on it, I don't want to say if I think Scott Watson is guilty or not guilty of murder. I think the evidence the physical evidence especially kind of speaks for itself. There absolutely is none. What I think Scott is guilty of is being a dickhead at that party, being a really shit guy when he's had a drink in him. But do I think he's guilty of murder? I don't know. What do you guys think? I really want to know what you guys think of this case in the comments down below. I'm going to be glued to these comments the night that this video comes out because I've been telling all my friends and family about this. I'm like, what do you think to this guy? I'm like giving him all the evidence and stuff and waiting to hear their responses. So I can't wait to hear what you guys think about this one. If you're from New Zealand and you have like a different take on this case, please again, leave that down below in the comments. That, that would really interest me as well. I think the thing that kind of frustrates me the most about this case, putting Scott Watt and out of our minds completely is that we have no idea what happened to Ben and Olivia. They could still be out there. And honestly, when you think back to a few of those witness testimonies that said they saw the two sail catch with the blue stripe and they saw a young couple sitting on there with an old scruffy man rowing it, like rowing it, sailing it. What if they just sailed away on this boat and they've, they've gone somewhere and they're still alive somewhere? We don't know what could have happened to them, but if police had actually seriously looked into those witness accounts, maybe we might have more answers now. Maybe that could have been Ben and Olivia. We don't know. Scott Watson has appealed his conviction multiple times. They've all been rejected. He's applied for parole four times. All of those have been rejected. His next parole hearing will be in 2023, but we can assume that will probably be rejected as well. Because like I said, unless he shows remorse and admits that he committed the murders, he probably won't get let out on parole, but he doesn't want to do that because he's hoping that he will be found innocent one day and that this was just a tragic miscarriage of justice. But yeah, that is all I have on this case. Thank you so, so much for watching and happy new year. Happy end of 2022. Let's have a good 2023, please, please. I'm begging on my knees. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you go to nordvpn.com forward slash Eleanor, there'll be an exclusive deal waiting for you there. And for this Christmas period, it's four bonus months free. How sick is that? Go click the link down below, you're welcome. A huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting the channel and helping me decide the cases that I cover. All of my tier two members are on screen right now, so thank you so much. If you wanna become a channel member, you can click the join button down below. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up. That would really help me out. If you wanna subscribe, there you go. There's a picture on my face. If you click that, you can click subscribe and then you'll be subscribed to my channel. I post true crime all the time, true crime all the time. And then here's another true crime if you wanna watch another video. Anyway, I'll see you next year, shall I? Bye, happy new year.